All right, so I want to thank Tony a lot for having me here. And it was a lot of fun to hang out with you guys yesterday, too. This is a really cool event in the way it's set up. It's very different than a lot of events I've been to. Um, what we're going to talk about here is going to be very tactical. It's going to be a little bit different than, you know, kind of what we've gotten so far. So you may want to take some notes. I am going to try and find a way to make the slides that I have available for you guys. Um, but I want to start with the first a couple questions first. Who here has a podcast? Yeah? Okay, good. Who here has been on a podcast? Who here does not know what a podcast is? <laughs> All right, we're winning. All right, so we're going to talk about booking celebrities on your podcast. We're going to talk about getting yourself booked on other podcasts because, let's face it, it's the biggest way to grow your show is with people that already know what a podcast is because there's like 12 steps to somebody that doesn't know what a podcast is subscribing to yours. So we're going to really get into some very tactical stuff that you can do. I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A so the presentation itself isn't super long because I want to make sure I can help you guys on your particular what you're looking to handle. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, do save those for the end, write them down because I want to make sure we get those handled as well. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the word influence. We see it being flaunted around a lot and if you guys see a podcast that Tony did, I think, was it two weeks ago or a week ago, Tony? With uh, Constable? Oh yeah, that's two weeks ago. There's a lot of fake influence out there. A lot of it. People that have paid for blue check marks, they've paid for followers that disappear overnight. We're going to talk about the only solid way you can quickly build real influence if you do it the right way. There's a right way and a very wrong way. And we're going to talk about the right way. We're not really going to talk about how to start your podcast because we're really going to take this at already having one. So um, there's other content I have around that which I'm very happy to share with you later on if you'd like to hear more about that. But influence is a game changer. Influence is what gets you invited to events. It's what helps your business to grow because people choose you over someone else because you have perceived influence. So we're going to talk about how to build that the right way today. So a little bit about me, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory. Um, not to just drop a lot of, you know, look at how cool I am. This is more of just so you can guys can see what I've accomplished. But I've had over 3 million downloads in the podcast space since I started in 2016, or 2015, sorry. Um, have almost 1,000 episodes. I've been named a 40 under 40 for uh, Podcast Magazine for 2022. I've been in Inc., Forbes, a lot of different places. So I've had a lot of credibility in the podcast space. So what I'm going to show you guys today does work. It is effective and it can make a big difference for your brand and for your podcast as well. So this is me in January of 2016. I had started a podcast in November of that year. And let me tell you how I got there. So I have my master's degree in ancient history not a very applicable thing to get a job with. And in 2012, I was a high school teacher. My mom ended up having a really bad stroke. And it made me look at a lot of the different things I was doing in my life and realizing, do I want to do this forever? You know, I'm not happy. I'm waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning because i got to help mom get dressed before school too. So it was not something I wanted to be doing every single day. And I actually was approached about a network marketing opportunity, which I know what that was, so I would have done anything at that point. But it was the first thing to get me to quit my job and try something different. I went from failing at that to failing at life insurance to leaving the promo code on my Amazon listing and losing all of my products in 20 minutes. So I was out of business very quickly. I started a podcast literally as a last ditch effort to really be a student. Because when I looked at the thing I was really good at in school, it was being a student. And by being a teacher, I had taken myself out of that role. And now, I'm actually teaching a different way. So I had almost no social following when I started in 2015. Everything I've built now is from the podcast I've created. So I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. So I started a podcast. It's called the Create Your Own Life Show. And that's really helped me to start to build real influence. It's helped people to get to know me. It's the thing that made me recognizable. Because before that, as I mentioned, there was nothing I was really successful at. I'd read a lot of books. I'd done a lot of things. I hadn't started a business yet, you know. But at this, that point in time, it was the thing that made me notable. Since then, I've been able to interview almost a thousand incredible people. You may recognize some of the names here of people I've interviewed. Um, Dave Rubin from The Rubin Report. Adam Curry, also known as The Podfather. General David Petraeus, who's the former CIA director. Brian Dawkins, who went to the Hall of Fame with the Eagles. So I've interviewed lots of incredible people, including Grant Cardone and a, and a lot of other awesome people. And I started appearing on podcasts. I've been on thousands of podcasts. 
And those two things have helped me to grow my influence, grow my brand, and to make a really big impact. So this is uh, actually from yesterday. So now I'm over 10,000 followers on Twitter, 70,000 on Instagram, and over 62,000 on Facebook. And that's all grown from the podcast. You know, I wasn't buying followers. I wasn't doing any of that weird stuff. This was all things that happened from what I've done on the podcast. And a lot of the media features I've gotten from the podcast have actually helped me to get verified because they're perceived incredible. So here's just some of the major media I've been featured on. And that actually led to me starting my current PR firm that we run. We run a company called Command Your Brand, where we help people get booked on podcasts as guests. And we didn't start it because I was like, I want to start a podcast PR firm. We started because people said, can you help me? You know, you've had 10,000 listens in your first month. You've had all these incredible celebrities. How can I benefit from the podcast world? And the way we did that was by starting this PR agency and help, helping people do a couple things. One, to tell a better story, and that's something we're going to talk about a lot today, is you need to tell a better story, you need to position it the right way, and you need to position it in the right places, right? Because the right place isn't for everybody, right? Everybody wants to be on Joe Rogan, but it's probably not the right podcast for everyone, right? There's a right place for your story, and that matters. I've also gotten to speak in a lot of places, nationally, internationally, and this is all from the podcast. I haven't reached out for any of these things. So I want you guys to imagine that you are connecting with people all over the world. I want you to imagine you're building influence. And I want you to imagine that your perfect customers are now looking for you. You're not constantly trying to show them why you're better, why you're impressive, why you're important. They've seen you, they've listened to you, they've perceived you, they've seen you with the right people. And because of that, they're willing to make the move for you. That's where a podcast should sit in your branding. I think a lot of people have a huge miscategorization in how a podcast fits. They think they get a podcast, they get all these downloads, they start getting advertisers, and it's this big money thing. How a podcast actually fits is it's number one, a networking vehicle for you to meet incredible people that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Number two, it is to create leads. And number three, it is that PR vehicle that fills that no like, and trust factor you need people to have for you. So it is vital to changing the game from where you are now to where you want to go. So we're going to talk first of all about booking celebrity guests. So how many podcasters do we have again here? OK, cool. So for those of you guys that have a podcast, this is going to be a lot more beneficial. Um, but do take notes if you don't have one, because these are things you can implement later on. So the first thing you want to start with is a targeted list. This is just a screenshot of, of one that I've had. And on day one, I started a, a Google Drive spreadsheet that I keep filling up. It started with 100 people when I started. It's got 500 on it now. And it has the date. It has the last thing that was said to that person, the last person on my team that talked to that person. What, did they give a time for follow-up? Did they say to leave me alone? Did they say never talk to me again? Whatever it may be. Um, I had one person say, never talk to me again. I'll, I'll leave their name out of it, because um, I'm kind. But Can you say that one more time? Yeah. So on that spreadsheet, I have, and it continues growing over time, but it started with 100. Now it's got like 500 on it. It tracks their priority, first of all. So they're pri prioritizing you know, how much I want them. It tracks the last time they were talked to, who on my team talked to them, what they said, if they have a follow-up date, or did they mention, hey, I have a book coming out in six months, because all those things matter. Because the, the, the first key thing is actually the spreadsheet, because it's boring and it's not sexy, but it's the thing a lot of people do wrong, is they just kind of do a bunch of outreach. And they say, oh, that person never talked to me. And it's, all right, well, how many times did you talk to them? Well, once. I thought about it. I thought really hard about it. So you really need to do that follow-up consistently. That is the really big difference that a lot of people aren't doing. So, it all starts with a spreadsheet. And I've gotten, you see the column here on the other side that's green. Those are people that I kept taking off the list because I kept booking them. And I put them there not because like, you have to, but more or less like, to show yourself, like, look what you've done on those days that sometimes you're going to get some bad ones. Because people can be real jerks sometimes. And you know what I usually find? It's usually assistants and not the person you're trying to talk to. So just understand that. So there's a hierarchy in pitching. And this is not something that the regular person understands. Social media, I used to put lower on the hierarchy, but it's actually gotten a lot better. 
I found Instagram to be less effective over the years because I think there's like four different inboxes now and it's really hard to land in the right one. Um, Twitter has really become my secret weapon. It works very, very, very well. Um, tend to you know, follow people, engage with them a bit before I reach out to them. I'll get into that strategy a little bit, in a, few, a little bit more in a few minutes. But Twitter's been the thing I've really done a lot more with recently. But the hierarchy looks like this. Starting on the bottom is the lowest. The agent, the manager, the publicist, the person. And the person I would kind of put their assistant next to. The further away you get from the person, the less access you're going to have, the less of a chance you're going to have, and the less that role actually has to deal with getting you a product. But when you can focus on talking to the right person, you're actually going to get results. That's why as well, when you're looking at social media, you need to be able to discern, does this person run their own social media? So like I've had AJ Hawk, I've had Nick Swisher, I've had Johnny Damon, they all run their own social media, and I've actually talked to them through Instagram. So you need to be able to determine, like, does this look like more personalized content, or does this look like a social team put it together from somebody? So that's actually really going to be helpful in how social focuses for you. Now we'll get into the tactics a little bit more in a few seconds, but how are you guys liking this so far? Yeah? Cool. As I said, this is going to be a l very, very tactical, and if you guys have questions, you know, like he said, repeat before, definitely do that because it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of talk. All right, so the only person you should never pitch is a speaker agent. Is there anybody in the room that actually has a speaker agent? Yeah? Because they get paid for speaking. So you never want to talk to that person because they're going to tell you it costs. I, I had this happen with Darren Hardy once before I nailed an interview with him. I talked to Darren Hardy's speaker agent. And they're like, all right, we're ready to book Darren. It's $20,000. I'm like, it's not. So if you ever go through a speaker agent, you're not, it's going to, they'll say yes, but it's going to cost you money. So you never go through a speaker agent to book a guest, right? It's a, it's a different hat they're wearing, right? They're not wearing a promotional PR hat. So you really want to think about that. So these are two really, really, really great tools. I'm going to give you guys a few tools too you're going to want to write down. IMDP Pro, Internet Movie Database. Anybody else a weird person that flips through IMDB when they're watching movies? Yeah? I always want to know what movie they're in. Always. I'll also admit I did it while watching Friends. Every season of Friends. Um, anyway, it's my wife's fault. But IMDB Pro, if you get the Pro version, I think it's like 29 bucks a month, you get their PR firm's information, you get their assistant's information, sometimes their information, as well as who is their agency of record. Like any information you should need if they've been in a movie, which a lot of times they have as cameos and things like that, you can actually get all that information from IMDB Pro. It's a gold mine, and it's 29 bucks a month. Um, another really great tool, contact any celebrity. I think I had a special one time that it was like 97 bucks for the first six months I had it. Um, I got Danica Patrick through that one. I'm trying to think of who else I got through that site, but it's actually pretty solid. It's one of those things you're like, oh, this looks spammy. It's probably not very good. But it's vital to have the right people to talk to to actually make all of this successful. That's why I haven't even talked about pitching yet. I've talked about tracking, and I've talked about where to find your people to talk to. There's another really, really vital tool that's been around for a really long time. It used to be called Email Hunter, but the website now is hunter.io. And you can get their Chrome extension, you can go to their site, and you can actually put in any website and see all the existing emails that, at that site if it's been able to scrape them online. Because once again, if you can email grant at grantcardone.com, you're going to have a better chance of getting them. Well, not better, but you may have more successful. Because I emailed Grant seven times before I met him at a benefit. And he's like, hey, man, what do you do? I have a podcast. Love to be on that podcast. Really? Your team said I need to 10x first. Um, so it's going to be a more successful way if you can get in contact with the person. So that's a few, t few tools for getting in contact with the right person. All right. As I said, Instagram, I've had a ton of success. If you want to message somebody on Instagram, you have to follow them first before you can DM them to open the DM box, but unless you're also verified, you're going to have a better chance of going into that box that nobody sees. I've gotten guests that way, but it's gotten less successful over the years. Twitter is incredible. And it's the one everybody's like, oh, I hate Twitter. Why is Elon buying Twitter? Twitter is really, really good for getting in touch with people. And the way you should actually use Twitter, I get newsmakers, I get political people, I get people that other people are talking about on Twitter. And the reason is, most people still use their Twitter account themselves. 
because it's usually coming directly from them. It's things they're thinking about. It's, it started as a texting service, so that's why it's still very oriented to people using it themselves. It is the single best place I get all my guests anymore. Other than email, I'm doing Twitter way too much. All right, so let's talk about how to pitch. Any questions on, on places um, or on places you should be using, tools or anything like that before we move on from here? Cool. All right, everybody's good on that? Liking this so far? Cool. All right, so how to pitch. Thing you never want to do, talk about your download numbers, even if they're good. Don't worry about it. You're putting yourself in a, in a box that you don't want to be fighting with. So just don't talk about download numbers, even if they're great. You want to lead with purpose, why you're doing this. You want to go to it for what's in it for them, because everybody's thinking about, well, I want to interview this person because of what's in it for me. You need to be thinking about it of what's in it for them. Do they have a book coming out? Do they have a media push? Do they want to talk about a charity they're really working with? I just had uh, Chef Andre Rush on my show. He cooked for four different White House chefs, or White, uh, presidents. And he was doing a PTSD uh, charity. So he wanted to talk about it. You really want to find out what's newsworthy and important for them, because otherwise there's so many people that want to interview them. You have to stand out because you care about them and care about what they care about. And it can't be the superficial thing. You actually have to give a crap. It matters. You have to talk about the very particular reason you want to reach out to them. So I have an uh, interview coming out in a couple weeks with Tulsi Gabbard. And when I reached out to Tulsi about the podcast, I said exactly what I had heard on three different other shows, what about it was different that I wanted to talk about and how I wanted to discuss it. And that said, OK, let's schedule. You want to come to them with a very particular reason you want to talk to that person. You don't just want to say, hey, I want to interview you because. That, I'll be honest with you, that worked seven years ago, and it worked really well. But now that there's 3.5 million podcasts out there growing by leaps and bounds every week, it's not as successful anymore. So you really want to be very particular about what you want to talk about, how long it's going to take, and how they're going to connect. Because that's an easier yes, because you gave them all the information they need, so they don't have to back and forth with you. You can actually get through the gatekeeper. Those things matter. Open tracking, if you're sending emails, is vital. There's something called banana tag. It's a Chrome extension you can get, and it tells you when somebody has opened an email, read it, and what they did with it. So that's another thing that's important to say, oh, they're just ignoring me. Did it go to spam? Because it may. A lot more things go to spam now. Another thing that's really cool, and I know Pete Vargas loves this, is bomb bomb. Is sending people bomb bomb videos is another way to get in front of them, show them you're a human being, and show them how you're different than what they're getting from everybody else. Because think about the people you want to talk to are getting thousands of pitches. So you need to stand out, show them how you're different, and show them how you value their time. Good so far? Cool. So follow-up is really key. You just see a couple date lines here on how long it took me to get some of these people. Years. Three years for Dave Asprey, almost five years for Ted Nugent, two years for Robin Sharma. I set Robin Sharma's interview six months before we even did it. They said, oh, he's busy. I'm like, busy until when? They're like, uh, six months now. I'm like, great. What's that date? And assistant's like, you know, gave me the date. We set the date. We had the interview. A no isn't always a no. If they say they're busy until blank, well, great. What's the date? Could we, could we do that? Would that work? Because you want to find out if it's a brush off or are they actually trying to work with you on it. Gretchen Rubin took two years. Michael Hyatt took four and a half years. Seth Godin, three years. So that spreadsheet I told you guys about in the beginning, follow-up is so key. Because you're doing what 95% of people won't do. There's a big percentage that's never going to send the email or the message or whatever in the first place. But 95% of them are only going to send one message. And they're going to be like, oh, they didn't talk to me. Anybody here a Foo Fighters fan? I am the huge Foo Fighters fan. I have talked to Dave Grohl's assistant 15 times. And she's really nice. And I don't, I don't think she's annoyed by me yet. We're getting there. Closer at some point. Hopefully soon. But follow-up is really, really key, guys. It's very key. All right, so any questions on booking celebrities? Because we want to get into booking yourself on other shows, but I want to kind of keep the content as much to one before we move on to the other. So we'll have a little Q&A quick, and then we'll get back to the other. How are we doing on time, Tony? Thirty minutes? Okay, cool. Any questions on booking celebrities before we move on? I want to get all your guys' questions. Ken. That's a tough one. 
so in terms of like asking them for a guest? Yeah, because I know people that know people. So it's worked well with other podcasters. So like, um, so here's a good, really good example. Um, I wanted to interview the associate editor of Newsweek, uh, Batya Unger Sargon, and I'm, I'm doing that when I get back. Um, I got it through my friend Andrew Heaton, who hosts a podcast called The Political Orphanage. I know Andrew really wanted to interview Tulsi Gabbard. So I hooked him up with that first, and I said, hey, I know, I just saw you had Batya on not long ago. I really want to interview her. Could you connect me? So it's trying to help before asking, and it doesn't always work if they don't have a podcast, but it's worked really well for me in that way, where I try to like do a solid before I ask for anything, because I feel, I feel like your bank account's not full if you're asking for something with nothing, you know? I just, not, maybe not the best answer, but does that help at least? No, cool. Anybody else questions on booking celebrities? Yeah. So many of the people that you put up there on your slide that you're looking to interview or that you have interviewed, yeah. I've never heard of most of them. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that they're not doing phenomenal stuff. But sure. How do you source those people? I mean, I. What? How do you get started, like, to find those type of interesting people that you would like to interview that you think your listeners would want to hear from? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, so it also depends on like where you're at in your journey because like Tony mentioned my my shows changed a lot in the last two years um, You know, I got a little bit more political. I started being a little bit more honest and open with who I am So who the conversation I'm having have changed a lot now what I did when I started um, What everything I was doing is a little bit more internet marketing, right? So I sat down I said like within this space who are the most important people for me to talk to right? So you want to look in your space and say like if I was to talk to what person because there's a concept called positioning, right? There's a great book by uh, Jack Trout and Al Reese. It was written in the 70s called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind. And they, the, the idea of positioning, and, and David's going to love this because he, he hates this example too, but positioning, you're taking something people are already familiar with and you're grabbing that, that spot in their mind. So a lot of people say we're the Uber of blank because they're taking the positioning Uber has in your brain and they're trying to grab that familiarity and put themselves with it. When you're interviewing celebrities, you're actually grabbing positioning. And it's in, within your space, right? They have to be people that you influence, those people would recognize. So you make a list of those people, and those people that would, number one, have great information for your audience, but number two, enhance your positioning, right? Because you have more credibility because you're seen next to them. Does that help? Cool. Any other questions about booking celebrities? No? Okay, cool. All right, so how many people do we have that have been on podcasts again? Cool. So now this is something everybody in the room can do. Now you will see a lot of the concepts we're going to cover in this are somewhat redundant because some of the same rules apply, but there are some very different things about this. So the thing you want to start with is getting some local press if you have no press at all. Because if you have no press at all, getting media is going to be very hard. So there's a strategy I like to talk about, and this is something all of you can do, and this is something that my wife did with me when I started. She's a PR mastermind. Right, Brielle? Yeah. And that strategy is called the small pond strategy. So everybody here is a big fish in a small pond somewhere. I grew up in a small town. It is five-eighths of a mile in size. Nothing happens there. Babe Ruth played golf there once. That's all that matters. We don't have a grocery store. If you go to the golf course that he played at, there's a sign above the urinal that says, Babe Ruth peed here. There's a sign on the floor that said he also peed here. So nothing happens in my town. Now that's actually a huge benefit. A lot of people would see that as a huge negative. It's a huge benefit that nothing happens in my town. So what a small pond means is you're, mis you're listing all the places. You start with the spreadsheet. You're listing all the places where media is going to be really easy for you to get. So that small town had, the, had a newspaper that went to every house in the county on a Thursday and it got mailed to every house. I knew their press day was Tuesday, meaning anything they had to print, they had to have by Tuesday to be in the paper by Thursday. Because nothing happens in that town, anytime I wrote a press release and sent it in, they printed it word for word, used my title too. Now here's the really cool thing about that. A lot of those papers, even if they're small, have been around long before the internet. So what that means is they're grandfathered into the internet when it came around. So they're actually all on Google News. So now you're getting in the paper, and you're getting a Google News hit. So now what you can actually do is you build a page in your website called a media page. 
And that media page is where you're going to put all of these media features. There's a really great article by HubSpot if you're looking for how to write a press release. And just put in whatever year you're doing. So right now it's 2022. How to write a press release in 2022. They update it every single year. You need to find out what's newsworthy about what you're doing, who cares and why. Send it to that local media and then get it up on your media page when it prints. Now these things are going to enhance your credibility so when you're reaching out to podcasts, they can say, huh, this person can talk. They could, they've done some media before. Because your first really big hesitance is that media can't have you. You have to be showing people, I'm media worthy, I've had media before. And that's a really great hack to start your local area. So things to think about. Your university that you went to whenever it was you graduated, do they have a, a, a magazine? A lot of them do, and they'll print stuff about people that graduated. I lived in a lake community for a little bit. They had a beautiful magazine that went around to everyone. They printed things. Our local newspaper did. Our regional newspaper did. The first time I got on TV, it was in the Bergen Record, and a producer happened to read it and said, hey, we'd love to interview you on New York Channel One. And that was the first time I got on TV. So media can always help to enhance the credibility before you're getting more. And you want to store all that in your media page. Now, something I want to go back to, since I've kind of been going with the flow with this and not exactly with my format here, is you also want to start with small podcasts, right? Because for podcasters, it makes sense that they want to hear you can talk. And you don't want to kind of ruin everything on a big show if you're not there yet, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with not being there yet. But you want to kind of get all your verbiage underneath you, get your training underneath you. Hey, I've done this a few times. It's going to work out. So you want to start with shows that have less than 20 episodes and less than 20 reviews. There's a phenomenon called pod fading. And that's shows that never make it to 20 episodes. And that's why we're focusing on 20 episodes, less than 20 episodes, less than 20 reviews. Now here's why. They're as new as you, if you're new. If you're not new, then don't worry about it. They're as new as you, and they need guests really bad because they're, they're new. So those are two things that are really going to help you with kind of getting your feet under you. And you can put them on your media page. You can say, look at the podcast I've done. So those are things that are going to be really helpful. And we haven't even talked about pitching a podcast yet. But these are things that are going to make you more successful in getting there. All right, everybody tracking so far? Yes. Cool. All right, everybody look like the small pond strategy? Yes. Yeah? It's something everybody can win with, right? And that's even if you're not going on a podcast. Everybody forgets local. They all want Forbes. They all want Inc. They all want these things. And they've never been in the small town newspaper. Those things are stairs. Media is not an elevator. It's stairs. So here's the most effective way to pitch. Don't. And this is something I was talking about on, t on Twitter earlier. I was kind of alluding to it. So what I like to do is, like, let's say, personally, I'm focusing on going on a really big podcast. They're active on Twitter. I will follow them on Twitter for six months. I will engage with everything they talk about. I will, con I will converse with them on everything they're doing. So now when I reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you've had a couple great points here and there, and I would love to actually talk about that with you on your show, it's now newsworthy. You know, I, I'm, do you guys know who Zuby is? No? Oh, bummer. OK. I'm going on Zuby's podcast next month from a conversation I had just like this with Zuby. So this strategy really, really works because you're not pitching. You're creating a relationship. And then when the time is right, showing how you can offer value. It's a really, really vital way to do it. So the most effective way to pitch is not to at all. Just be somebody's friend and add value on social media. You could do this on LinkedIn too, but you have to be a lot more tactful. I had a slide I took out that said LinkedIn is a dumpster fire, because it kind of can be. LinkedIn is a dumpster fire. Um, it's kind of like you go on a date with somebody and you're like, so let's get married. That's how LinkedIn is right now. So you have to be a little bit careful in how you use it, but there is a ton of value there if you learn how to use it the right way. But you can still pitch if you're not vomiting on people on, link on LinkedIn. And as I mentioned, Instagram does not work as well as it used to, just because there's too many inboxes now. It's, it just, I discovered there's even another one inside my hidden inbox. There's a hidden inbox to that inbox. It's like a, one of those Russian dolls. So once again, this may look familiar to you guys. Lead with purpose. Subject lines are really good. I find if you're sending an email, a subject line should be some sort of a question that the person reading it will want to an answer. That's actually really, really effective. Because if it's a good question, they'll be like, I know the answer to that. And then they'll open it, and they'll want to see more. 
So a really good question actually provokes somebody to open an email. We've tried so many different subject lines, and we found questions work really, really well. So when you're pitching, be very particular about how you can help that person's audience, what you can teach them, and what the listener is going to walk away with. Not, I have a book to hawk, or I want to sell my product, or I have a course launch, and it's game time, baby, whatever it may be. You want to be that guest that shows up, and for 30 or 45 minutes, you are just there to help, you're there to teach, you're there to offer value, you're there to be the expert, and here's the thing you're going to find. You're really going to win like that. People are going to buy your books, and buy your programs, and book calls with you, because you're actually a genuine person that gives a shit about them. If I'm allowed to swear, I don't know. <laughs> is that how I get blacklisted? No? OK. But you want to be very particular about how you can help their audience. Because podcasters really curate these shows to help people. And if they can sense that you're somebody that's going to be there like a promo bot, it's going to be over. So that's how you're really going to win. Open tracking, once again, is really important. Because you can see, like, am I just hitting a spam box? And it's also going to tell you what's more effective, because you're going to see what they're doing with it as well. And BombBomb Bomb is another really great way. There's other services out there like it, but I know I had heard Pete Vargas mention it, I think, like five or six years ago at a Keith Yackey event about how effective it is. And it's just really, really good stuff. Because it's just another different. Anybody know what BombBomb Bomb is? Or am I just using a word you never heard of? OK, so BombBomb Bomb is a service that lets you send a video to somebody via email. But it makes the still image for the video like, a, like an animated GIF, where you're like waving or something like that. So it allows you to kind of break through the ordinary of what people receive, and not just a text email. Like, oh, they made me a video. That's kind of cool. So it allows you to communicate to somebody in a different way. So you always want to be using email, as, as I mentioned, because email still works. It still works if you're using it the right way. Not the wrong way, you're, where you're copy and paste blasting everybody. You're writing something particular to that person about that show and what matters to you, about that show and what they can walk away with that they can't get from any other speaker. Because when you can really teach, you're building influence because you're now teaching. You're having people now become more educated as not only your buyers, but also your advocates. We've had people tell other people about us from podcasts, and that person never bought anything from me. But it's because they told people about my agency, about myself, about my books, whatever it may be. And it's been really great to us getting out there. So who wants a quick hack to getting verified? All right, so you want to give Tony $10,000. And then he's going to leave the room, and you're never going to see him again. So anybody, first of all, anybody that does that, don't give them money if anybody there, out there has thought about that. But one of the qu really quick ways to getting verified, something people don't think on. Focus on podcasts that are actually contributors to major media. That's how I got verified on Twitter, and it's how I got verified on Facebook. My first Forbes feature was a podcast interview. My first Inc. feature was a podcast interview. Um, Capitalism.com was a podcast interview. I've gotten a lot more media features since then, but you can actually grab a lot of these easily because people don't realize they're actually printing as articles to these other major media areas. So that's a really great way to get verified, because media is actually what matters to you getting verified. It's gotten more competitive now, but this is a great hack that if you're not thinking about it, go on podcasts that are contributors to major media. It's really going to help you guys. So any questions on getting booked on podcasts? Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Ah, so like you see people on social media have the blue check mark? That's like an authentic personality? like on Twitter or Facebook. So if you have a, a lot of media, you can get what's called being verified. And that's where you have a blue check mark that shows other people you're like a credible celebrity or whatever it is. And that's called being verified. The social media company, either Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whoever it may be. And within your niche, that shows people that you're like more authoritative because you're like you know, the person. And um, you can usually get that by media credibility is how you do it. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. OK, so what you want to do is if you go to some of these sites like Forbes, you go to the contributor section, you go to podcasts, 
you'll see there's like some leadership lady that you have never heard of has a podcast on there and it, foc and it, push it pushes to Forbes and you get a Forbes article because that's where, the, that's where the show goes. But they actually, people aren't competing for that because they don't realize it. But there's not actually a ton of competition. You can get media features that way. That's how I got my early ones. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. So how much are you repurposing each and every podcast for like rep.com and, and then submit to Forbes or anything like that? Are you, is that what you're doing? With every single episode? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I have my marketing team running through and we have drop boxes and drop boxes and drop boxes of stuff. And we're getting months out of each 30 minute episode because they're pulling out quotes, they're making headliner videos, they're doing all sorts of stuff because what we will do too is we'll ask podcasts, hey, can I have the raw video so we can also make our own promo to push more, co more traffic to your podcast. So we're doing so much content for each episode because I think a lot of people just think, all right, the episode's out, that's great, it's the end of it. And a really good media feature has two parts to it, right? Because a lot of people want to be effect of PR, meaning PR happens to you. You should actually be effective with PR. How can you use it? And that's the really big thing that you need to learn about your media features. How can you write blog posts with this? How can you make quote cards with this? How can you use this to you know, write for the different places you contribute or whatever it may be? There's so many different ways you can use content when you're thinking with it. Does that help? Cool. Any other questions? Well, that's all I got, man. All right, guys. Give me a hand. Thank you, sir.